Hi everyone, this is Saveda from Zephyr Lake Carmelite Mission. I'm going to continue with my lessons on the phase one formation for Lake Carmelites. And in today's lesson, we are going to discuss about four role models for Carmelites, four saints of the Carmelite spirituality. And the lesson topic title today is Carmelite Role Models Figures Throughout Carmelite History. And we will see that there is a common thread of suffering in the lives of these saints along with their deep spirituality and love of God. We see that they suffer personal loss of good health and also they lose um, loved ones, you know, very close family members to illness very early in their life. And that seems to be a common thread with saints in general, but Definitely, we see that in some of our saints we are going to look at today. And the first saint we are going to look at is Venerable John of St. Samson. He was born in 1571 in France. And when he was very young, at the age of three, he became blind for life because of smallpox. And at the age of 10, his parents died. And he was a very talented musician. It said that he could learn to play any new instrument within 15 minutes. He was so gifted. And uh, he, he moved to Paris with his brother, um, uh, John Baptiste. And his brother and his brother's wife also die. And so then he has really nothing. You know, he's homeless. He's blind. And then he meets this priest, Carmelite priest, Father Matthew Pinout, and that's how he gets introduced to the Carmelite spirituality. And although he was blind and he was poor, it is said that he spent his life in contemplative prayer. He spent several hours in peaceful meditation, and at the age of 35, he joined the Carmelite order, and then uh, he moved to uh, Rene, France, where the Turin reform was just picking up. And, uh, you know, his simplicity of life was an inspiration to also, um, I'm sure, the friars there. But his main contribution to Carmelite uh, order is the fact that he was the spiritual soul of the reform of Turin. Um, so Turin reform was around trying to go back to the early eremitical life that was led by the hermits on Mount Carmel, which by that time in the 1500s had declined greatly in Europe. And uh, the reform itself was guided by Philip Thibault. But we know that uh, Saint... Uh, Venerable John of St. Samson had a great impact on this reform as well. And we read here that uh, the reformers emphasized poverty, simplicity, and a strict following of the common life. And uh, St. John of St. Samson, he, when he uh, was transferred to Rennes in France, he had to go through with a second novitiate. All the friars, even though they were already, had already passed their novitiate, they had to do a second novitiate because they had to discern, even the friars had to discern whether they really wanted to live this more austere uh, life of poverty and simplicity that the reform was emphasizing. And John's description of the rule was as follows. He said, it is to be lost in the object of contemplation, God and the things of God. And through that method of prayer, he remained in a deep state of union with God. And also he said that observing the rule was part of doing the will of God. So it says John believed that all Christians could come to a direct experience of union with God through grace. 
and also uh, St. John of St. Samson. He was uh, very uh, dedicated to scripture. Scripture was very important to the formation of his spirituality. And because of his influence on the reform of Turin, he became uh, to be known as the true spiritual soul of the reform of Turin. And uh, during his life, he spent about 24 years after completing his second novitiate. Uh, he spent time caring for the sick and playing his organ and uh, acting as a fit no novice master. And he emphasized the importance of silence and solitude as a means of achieving a life of prayer. And towards the end of his life, uh, he um, uh, developed some severe ulcers and other health problems. And he died on the Feast of the Exaltation of the Cross on September 14th, on 1636. And it is said that he continually repeated the Hebrew names of God, which is Yahweh, Adonai, Eloikim, and um, he renewed his religious profession before dying by kissing the cross and uttering the words, with Christ I am nailed to the cross, and then he died. So Saint um, John of Saint Samson was still called as the heart of the reform of Turin. And the province of Turin was uh, destroyed or it didn't um, survive the French Revolution. But the reform of Turin did spread across the world and across all of Europe and worldwide and brought about the true transformation and uh, so that the people again started to live the Carmelite charism as lived by John of St. Samson and all those who were part of the reform. The second saint that we are going to see today is Saint Mary Magdalene de Pazzi. And she was a mystic, a very a deep mystic. And she was born also in the 1500s, 1566. Uh, the very year it says here, the year that St. Teresa of Jesus died. And our current prior general, Father Michael O'Neill says, one of the striking things about the content of her experiences, that is her mystical experiences, is the clarity she acquires in relation to the truths of our faith. So that was a testament to the authenticity of her mystical experiences. And today her body lies in state and incorrupt in a small chapel in her convent outside Florence. And the only signs of decay are from the periodic washings of her body over the years. Not all the saints' bodies are incorrupt, but some of the saints, their bodies incorrupt as a sign of their sanctity while they were still living on this earth. And also as a hope for us in the resurrection of our bodies. So those are the two reasons I believe God allows this miracle of incorruption of the body. Saint uh, Mary Magdalene, her original name was Katrina de Pazzi, and uh, she practiced mental prayer from the age of nine. And she was educated by Dominican sisters and she came from a wealthy family in Florence, uh, in Italy. And uh, at the age of 16, she became, uh, uh, she entered the Carmelite Monastery of St. Mary of Angels. And that's where she took the name Mary Magdalene. And so she's known as St. Mary Magdalene de Passy. And she chose Carmel because the Sisters of Carmel were making communion every, they would receive daily Holy Communion, which was very uncommon in those days. And that's why she chose to enter that particular Carmel, even though they were very austere and very strict observance of the rule. And right before her profession, she became extremely ill. And so they expedited her profession. And they, because of her great love for the Holy Trinity, they professed her on the Trinity Sunday. 
but and immediately after her profession she started to experience these ecstasies it on the day of her profession she, her ecstasy lasted for 2 hours and she kept experiencing ecstasies for the next 40 days every time immediately after receiving holy communion and as a result of her ecstasies her illness the one that was serious life threatening illness disappeared completely and these were some of her verbal expressions that she would use uh, when she went into the ecstasy the first one was veni sponsor mia which means come my beloved it was a personal call from god to her to come to that union and then after receiving communion she would say just after receiving communion i began to ponder and then she would go into ecstasy as she was pondering and her last verbal expression and the simplest was as i pondered the gospel of the day and her rapture or her ecstasies would last from few minutes up to some once uh, sometimes up to 19 hours she would be in ecstasy and uh, she had the ability to read the soul or the hearts of her novices in order for her to be able to guide them and even though she was sick she would wake up at midnight to pray the divine office because it was very important to her and she based all her personal prayer on the prayer of the church for her the liturgical celebration was a fulcrum of the life of piety and prayer and that was said by Redemptus Wallerbeck, a friar. And also she had visions of saints, Mary, John the Apostle and Saint Augustine are some of them who appeared to her in, her in her ecstasy and during her visions. And she experienced these mystical experiences for 20 years. And when she fell ill toward right before her death at the age of, uh, 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 in 1604, she became paralyzed and she, again, she suffered much during her last days. And her face, they said, her face was most beautiful, her skin rosy. She did not seem to be the person illness had made thin and deathly pale. And right before she died, she said, Rejoice with me, for my winter is at an end. And then she died. So again, we see suffering as a common thread in the lives of all these saints. And the next saint, one of my favorites, and I, favorites in my family, and traditionally it is, she has been such an inspiration to many of us who are, dead, who are devoted to Our Lady of Mount Carmel, Saint Tress of the Child Jesus and the Holy Face. She's also known as a little flower. In fact, here I'm reading, say, blessed Titus Bransma, who I love dearly. He just is one amazing saint who inspires me, just his very thought inspires me tremendously. And he says this, this one flower has in turn drawn attention to so many others that the world has been filled with admiration for life in Carmel. And I cannot agree more, I think, she is, if I had to name one Carmelite saint who has brought the entire church to Carmel, it is Saint Therese of the Child Jesus, the Little Flower, Saint Therese of the Holy Face. And also Titus Bransma says, to be one of the loveliest and the most eloquent examples of the school of Carmel. That's how he describes Saint Therese. And he also gives reasons, many reasons for that her practice of the presence of God, her love and trust in God, the peace, the practice of humility and simplicity and her conformity to the will of God, leading the most ordinary life without being in the least remarkable. She knows how to make her life an uninterrupted series of the most heroic acts of virtue and to be continuously busy with God. Stress of the child Jesus and of the holy face as she's most commonly known is also a doctor of the church and she's a patroness of the missions but remember she never left the cloistered convent you know she she became a cloister she entered cloister at the age of 15 
three of her older sisters were already in the cloister in France. Uh, she, they all were in uh, Carmel in Lisieux. And another sister of hers was in a visitation monastery. So they were, they were all, and they lost, uh, she lost her mother when she was very young. I think she was eight or seven or something, very young. And then, you know, when she was in the convent, she lost her father too. And she herself died at a very early age of 24. And in that short time, through her prayers, without leaving the cloister, she brought so many people, you know, to faith and to Christ. And that's why she's called as a patroness of the missions. And her spirituality, we can go on and on, but, you know, it was Christocentric. She looked at God not as a just judge and a punisher and who is severe, but rather as a God who in the face of Christ revealed his compassion and his mercy. And in her autobiography, Story of a Soul, she, she writes about God's mercies and she writes, pre, um, she was able to conquer her own preoccupation with her own needs to the freeing experience of accepting God's merciful love. So she's one person who was not born a saint, but she worked hard to become a saint and she did indeed become one. And of course, as all saints do, she had a great devotion to the Eucharist. And she, she writes in one of her poems, the Sacristan of Carmel, we are hosts which Jesus wants to change into himself. And Therese, had a strong desire to receive the Blessed Sacrament more frequently, even though frequent reception of Holy Communion was uncommon during her time. Another thing that she lived out was vacare deo, which means having one's heart empty for God so that God can fill that emptiness. So that's how she experienced and she received Holy Communion is to empty herself so that God can fill the emptiness and make room for God in our hearts. And her little way was one of living a, a, a childlike trusting relationship by looking to God as a loving father. And she saw God's love for us as unconditional. It says here, Therese was convinced that God was always present to her, that God loved her, and that this love was freely given. It was absolutely unmerited. And she kept that, you know, she showed us that God uh, loves us unconditionally through her loving, trusting um, friendship with God. And also, um, Therese trusted that God would show the, her the way. She shows us that by turning ourselves over to God and emptying our own hearts, permits the Lord to fill us with gifts. The Holy Communion is a gift from God, you know. And uh, Teresa's experiences were not all rosy. She had several challenges she had to encounter in, the, uh, in her convent, but she always lived it out by uh, using all those sufferings and all those trials as opportunities to offer up her sufferings to God as, you know, as uh, her little way. That was her little way. Um, and she had a great devotion to the Blessed Mother. In fact, when she was very ill at a, as a young, uh, uh, young teenager, she saw the statue of Our Lady come alive and smile at her. And through that, her illness was cured. She, the, nobody knew what was wrong with her. She was terribly ill. And then after the statue smiled at her, she was just fine instantly. And she considered the scapular, the brown scapular, as Mary's veil, veil and a sign of Mary's constant goodness and protection in all of her circumstances of life. And it says here, Mary was very tangibly Teresa's mother, especially in light of her own mother's early death. And also she writes, at the very first moments of my life, you have taken me in your arms. That's, how, that's what she says about our Blessed Mother. And she always lived under Mary's veil, where she would find that place of total surrender to Jesus. So she loved the scapular. You know, the scapular was very special. It was Mary's veil to her. 
and also um, Saint Therese had a great devotion to the scripture and she would uh, she sa it says here that in the gospel Therese finds Mary and when she does she connects with the Annunciation like Mary she offers her heart and like Mary she pondered the word in silence and here the uh, Vallebec writes of Therese's understanding of Mary's silence. In the episode of Joseph's discovery of Mary's being with child, what strikes Therese more than anything else is Mary's silence. With a single word, she would have calmed Joseph's fears. Uh, fears. She remained silent. Why? Out of humility, but even more deeply because she had to put all her trust in God. And we know that St. Teresa's model of the Carmelite charism was to use every opportunity of trial, pain and suffering to offer her suffering as a gift to God. She worked her way into becoming a saint by trusting in God as a little child. And Wilford McGreal describes a little flower in this way. Therese is an immortal diamond crafted by love in her suffering and in her creative way of living. And Therese herself explains her life in this way. I understood that love comprised all vocations, that love was everything, that it embraced all times and places in a word that it was eternal my vocation at last i have found it is love my vocation is love yes i have found my place in the church and it is you oh my god you have given me this place in the heart of the church my mother i shall be love that i shall thus i shall be everything and thus my dream will be realized so that is saint Tress, and this uh, brings us to our last saint who is just one amazing saint and also one of my most favorite and who is, gives me a practical way to live my Carmelite spirituality is Brother Lawrence of the Resurrection. The holiest and most necessary practice in the spiritual life is that of the presence of God. That's what Brother Lawrence says in Spiritual Maxim. It consists in taking delight in and becoming accustomed to his divine company, speaking humbly and conversing lovingly with him all the time at every moment, without rule or measure, especially in times of temptation, suffering, aridity, weariness, even infidelity and sin. This simple way is the only way to remain union, in union with God constantly every moment of our life without interruption. So Brother Lawrence of Resurrection was also born in France in 1614. And uh, at the age of 18, he experienced a spiritual conversion. And, uh, but he still went off as a soldier and he fought the 30 years war. But then he was imprisoned and everything. And after he was freed, um, he's continued to um, discern his calling. He went off to live as a hermit for a while, and then he uh, finally went to uh, uh, Paris, and he entered the Discals Carmelites, but he was received as a lay brother, not as a friar. And that's where he was given the name Lawrence of the Resurrection. And just like St. John of the Cross, he also experienced a dark night and uh, Brother Lawrence had a great devotion to the Blessed Mother and um, he had complete trust in her protection and to him Mary was his refuge in all the problems of his life in his troubles and anxieties. It says here that he didn't get disturbed in his soul because he would go to Mary as his refuge. And he too had some physical ailments of his leg um, and it was very painful and he would offer that up as part of his, um, uh, his prayer life. And he talked to the poor and the wealthy all alike. He treated everyone the same way 
and he lived as a lay brother for more than 50 years and he died uh, in 1691 at the age of 77 and brother lawrence's spiritual way is all do uh, uh, documented uh, in the writings of his biographer joseph de beaufort and his longtime friend and it's all his letters of Brother Lawrence are also wonderful. He very hesitatingly writes about his spiritual way in those letters. A spiritual journey of uh, Brother Lawrence's method of spirituality not only inspired Catholics and Carmelites, but also many Protestants have benefited from his writings and continue to do so even today. Brother Lawrence offers something close to a promise if his path is followed. He says, the joy of living in the presence of God, we will experience it continuously if we followed his path. And he also offers the hope that even if not practiced well enough, the very fact that the sincere effort is being made indicates that there is a focus on being in the presence of God. So, you know, it's not that you're going to be successful, but as long as you follow it and have the desire to remain in the presence of God, you're going to experience the presence of God. His method, the practice of the presence of God, is described here. Uh, it actually is living in the presence of God, is experiencing actual union of the soul with God all the time. Not just in the moments of ecstasy, but, ex but living in that union constantly. And the way he says it's a re repetitive and continuous bringing of the mind back to God. And this can be done both while at work and at quiet times of prayer. And he, here is the means that he gives us in, to acquire the presence of God. So if I've said too much in this video, this next few things I'm going to say is probably the most important in order to make a transformation in your life, in order to be able to live in the presence of God. The first is living a life of great purity. Great purity of life, number one. Two, fidelity, being faithful to this path that he's going to describe, that is continuously and repetitively bringing your mind back to God by being gentle, humble, and loving without becoming anxious over it doing it in a gentle way not in a you know aggressive in a, a strong way but gentle humble and loving without becoming anxious over it the inner awareness is there even if we only experience it for a moment do not get discouraged because it takes time and practice do what you can to foster the practice in your everyday life formulate a few words interiorly spontaneously one example he gives is, my God, I'm completely yours. Our minds may wander, but when they do, bring them back to God. The practice may be difficult at first, but it brings grace from God. And when we continually and faithfully practice it, it is the surest and easiest form of prayer. So that is Brother Lawrence's spirituality. And I know I practice this all the time. This is like, this is a gem. And this has helped me tremendously. And he also mentions in his spiritual maxim, I know that few persons reach this advanced state. He's talking about the perfect union. Very few stay, uh, persons reach that. It is a grace God bestows only on a few chosen souls. Since this simple awareness remains ultimately a gift from his kind hand. But let me say for the consolation of those who desire to embrace this holy practice, that he ordinarily gives it to souls who are disposed to receive it. If he does not give it, we can at least acquire with the help of ordinary grace, a manner and state of prayer that greatly resembles this simple awareness by means of the practice of the presence of God. So those are the four saints, Carmelite saints, with one being a lay brother. And essentially, I just like to summarize here that people of all faiths can benefit from this Carmelite spirituality. You know, 
practicing the presence of God, everybody can benefit from it. In fact, in the Jewish faith, we have the Shema, where Deuteronomy chapter 4, uh, sorry, chapter 6, verse 4 to 9, God's presence is written in our hearts and should be with us regardless of what we are doing, whatever we are doing. And that is regardless of faith for all people, regardless of, you know, whether you believe in Christianity, Judaism, Muslim, Hindu, you know, whatever faith, you, you, the God's presence is already written in our hearts. We just need to make ourselves aware and keep our mind on God so that we can live in his presence. And we know that the hermits on Mount Carmel, they memorized the Bible, especially the book of Psalms, because they didn't have printed Bibles. So that's how they, uh, you know, lived in uh, the, the scriptures by memorizing and then the Lexio Divina that we talked about in previous videos is a method of meditation. And, and it's an attitude, more than a method of meditation, it is an attitude of prayer. And the difference between meditation and contemplation, meditation requires our effort. But with contemplation, it's a gift from God. When we make the effort to keep our minds on God, God just completely consumes us and it's a loving gaze between the soul and God, where time and space stand still. And it's just a, con a contemplative gaze that can only be experienced. And Lexio during meals as, is also, as we know, a practice that's recommended by the rule of St. Albert for all communities, but also for family, because a family is a community too. And God has revealed himself not only in the person of Jesus Christ, but also through the scriptures. So God is revealed when we read the scriptures and contemplation, as we know, is a gift of God, but it can be received by everyone who is receptive to him. God wants to give us all the gift of contemplation. That's what I believe and I know many saints believe that. And we know Jesus himself proclaimed the scripture when he went the, entered the synagogue he read the book of Isaiah and said, today this scripture reading has been fulfilled in me. And also after his resurrection, when he appeared to two of his followers on the road to Emmaus, he explained the scripture to them and their hearts were burning. And uh, we know that Mary read the scripture and pondered on it and she acted on it. And I'm sure Elijah read the scripture, whatever was available to him at that time. And so did all the patriarchs and the prophets of the Old Testament. And the Car Carmelites promote the reading and the study of the Bible today. So we have Bible studies, we have Bible uh, in institutes of study that focuses on uh, the biblical aspect. And also we have many Carmelite scholars who are biblical sco scholars. And the practice of Lexio Divina is a requirement for Carmelites. We are supposed to pray and meditate on the scripture every day for at least 20 minutes. And as we know that uh, St. Tress said that the gospel sustains her, I'm sure it'll sustain us too. And Lexio Divina not only uh, is a practice to, for us to meditate on God, but we know Lexio Divina transforms us. Lexio Divina is like the water that waters the faith in our soul so that our faith can grow. And without having our scripture, our faith will be stunted, our growth will be stunted, our growth in holiness will be stunted. So Lexio Divina waters our faith, waters our soul and makes us grow holier. And also Lexio Divina can be practiced not only as individuals and as communities of Carmelites, but also in our homes, as home is a domestic church. So even if nobody else is reading, if you read the scripture, you're bringing God's word into your family. So that's all I have today on uh, the Carmelite saints. And with that, we will be uh, wrapping up our lesson 11. I hope you enjoyed watching this and thank you for watching.